Fantastic. Great. Okay. Well, so welcome everyone to the, the fifth event in the Pasture for Life winter webinar series. I'm really delighted to have all of you here with us this evening. Um, I'm Clem Sanderson. I'm the Scotland Regional Facilitator for Pasture for Life. Uh, so I work with farmers and butchers and restaurateurs and all the kind, all people that are interested in, in pasture fed uh, meat and dairy up in Scotland um, and do quite a lot of the supporting networking and skills sharing in Scotland. And I also have a particular interest in goats because I'm trying to set up um, some urban farming in Glasgow uh, with native breed goats. So this is just a brilliant excuse to get two uh, lovely speakers to, to tell us all more about what they're doing and hopefully share knowledge amongst all the people um, here in the in the room this evening as well, because a lot of you already keep goats too. So we really welcome this as an open space to share ideas and questions. And please feel free to use the chat for that um, and do ask questions throughout and I'll come to them at the end. The format for this evening will be um, after this little brief introduction, uh, Ruth Dalton is going to speak about um, her system, pasture fed goat system in Cumbria. Uh, and then we'll have Adam Short talking about what he's doing with Old English Goats down in Devon. Um, and after that, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A and a bit of discussion and, and sharing knowledge. So that's the plan for this evening. Um, and I just also wanted to um, introduce a little bit of a global context just briefly, uh, because John Meadley, who is uh, one of the founders of Pasture for Life, um, chaired a, a webinar back in 2021 at Oxford Real Com Oxford Real Farming Conference. Um, and it was really fascinating. It was called Goats, the Hidden Transformers. Um, so I'm going to share a link in a bit to that. Um, but it just gave a really brilliant perspective um, on how important goats are um, to rural communities around the world and what a transformative role they play, um, particularly in harsh environments, um, because they can transform the most indigestible plant material into meat, milk, skins and manure, which is so important to so many communities and particularly for food security. Um, and they're, they're really vital to the economic independence and resilience of rural women in particular. So I just sort of wanted to highlight a couple of stats from that talk um, that happened in 2021, because I thought it was really interesting that um, out of the 1 billion goats globally, 41% are in Africa um, and goats contribute approximately 15% to rural household income. So they're a really crucial part of, of incomes. Um, there's 21 goats per household on average in Botswana. So uh, if we all had 21 goats, that would be interesting. Um, and they contribute to the livelihoods of 90% of the rural population in Malawi. So all these stats are from Farm Africa, who do a lot of work um, supporting uh, rural, rural development and rural livelihoods. Um, and so I'll, I'll share I'll share a link to that webinar, but I thought it was a good um, way to get into thinking about goats in a UK context to just think more globally about how important they are. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, um, I will pass over to Ruth, who's going to kick us off talking about her Golden Guernseys. Um, so, yeah. Hello. Thank you, Clem. <laughs> Let me try and do the screen sharing thing without messing it up. So hopefully if I hit that button there, it will go to the full slide. Can everybody, the people that have got their videos on, can someone give me a thumbs up or a nod or something if you can see that? Yep, Yay, that's looking thank you. great. Thank you, that's brilliant, thanks. So um, yes, I was delighted to be asked by Clem to do a double act with Adam on this presentation, but I do feel a little bit of a fraud. We haven't had goats uh, for an incredibly long time, only about four or five years. And so there'll be people on this call with much more goat experience than me. Um, I've been really delighted by having them. And although we thought long and hard about getting them and it was several years of a process of a thought process before we actually found the goats we wanted we were prepared for it not to work in our system we are very low input as i'll explain and i just thought they might be a lot of work and not really suit our system so i'll explain how that all went on and um let you know how it how it how it went so just to give the context of our farm and um, just about where the words the farm are that patch of land there there's about 60 acres of scrub 
and it was very brackeny, uh, sort of what we would call here in Cumbria, low fell. So I'm in the South Lakes, so southern um, Cumbria and quite near Kendal. So what we did on the farm uh, when we first came here is we were very keen to transform uh, one big piece of land that was very brackeny and scrubby, uh, keep the scrub element, plant some more trees where it obviously wanted to be woodland, but also restore the grassland. So the picture that should have come up on your screen, that's a little bit of land that absolutely isn't mowable, but we were very determined to turn it into a more species rich grassland. And that got a lot of attention from us. And it has now become a really beautiful sort of like an upland hay meadow assemblage of, of wildflower species. And gradually on all the other pastures, we've fed species rich hay and we've done various things to try and get the diversity back. So we're really managing our farm for wildlife. My partner works for Cumbria Wildlife Trust. So he's really on the habitat side and I'm more on the livestock side. We've also got a beautiful wetland right at the bottom of our land. Um, the bits that are the edges and the bits that are ignored by more intensive farming often are the, are the parts where you get a lot of species diversity remaining and we've got a really great assemblage of species in there. So what we did when we came, you can see this was taken in 2011. And it shows some of the new tree tube plantings and the, uh, the start of a hedge there just looking that's looking west on our land and then this was about 10 years later so i think a really great photo to show that it doesn't take ages for trees to grow and you know if you're thinking of tree planting and thinking oh we'll never see it in my lifetime um as many of you will know it's surprisingly fast um and so we because we'd fenced off a lot of woodland areas we created little pastures in between. We've got lots of edge habitat, which is where loads of threatened species and unthreatened species, a lot of wildlife likes to live on the edge. But also a lot of the things you don't want when you fence off woodland, like very dense bramble encroaching into pastures started to be a little bit of a problem in our sheep and cattle based system. So these are the livestock that we've got. Our main enterprise is Shetland cattle. They're a small, relatively hardy breed from the Shetland Islands. They're dual purpose, which I really like the dual purpose breeds. A lot of them are rare now because farming specialised itself into meat and dairy, but these dual purpose breeds have so much to offer. They rear a really good uh, calf or lamb or um, goat kid. They're suitable for low input systems. And at the end of the day, beef that you get from an animal that can also give you dairy is the most environmentally sustainable beef you can eat. So we don't milk our cows, although we could, um, but we wanted to complement the cattle and the small number of sheep that we've got as well with something that would just rotate around our pastures, possibly before or possibly after our other stock and eat back the scrub up to the woodland edge. And also something that could utilize this amazing habitat and food source that we had in our fenced off woodlands. So they were deer fenced, deer couldn't get in anymore. And to maintain sort of, a mosaic of habitats in the wood as the trees got up we really wanted to put something in there that could eat the bramble eat the lower story sort of put put animals in there in the winter time just to kind of keep the diversity going in those otherwise fenced from all stock areas so that's what we wanted our goats for we wanted them to be something we could sell as a product off the farm we sell um our cattle as breeding females and as meat in meat boxes and we sell the sheep mainly as meat in meat boxes so with the goats I wanted a breed that was a native British breed at the time the only two breeds that were on the RBST watch list that were recognised uh, were the Golden Guernsey and the Bagot and we chose the Golden Guernsey we wanted to support a rare breed um, and now through loads of work by Adam and other people, we've got more breeds on the watch list. So maybe my breed choice might have been a little bit different if there'd been more to choose from. So I'll be really interested to hear Adam's talk. We went with the Golden Guernsey. They're a high value animal. There's a lot of demand for Golden Guernsey. So I was confident that we'd be able to sell breeding stock. I was also confident that the weathers would finish a little bit like primitive sheep on our low input system, probably at about 18 months old. And there was that chance that we'd also be able to milk the nanny. So I thought they ticked a lot of boxes. It's really weird not being able to see anyone. I'm like, oh, ask questions as we go along. But I guess Clem's going to cover that at the end. You're doing great, Ruth. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so I think I've sort of covered why goats. Um, we wanted them for this scrub bashing role. We have absolutely loads of gorse. Now, gorse is an incredible foodstuff. When they've done analysis on gorse, they found it's got the protein value of oats. 
So when you see animals nibbling at it and think, oh my God, what are they doing? Uh, they've actually got a, a good sense to them to, to eat that thing. And um, we just wanted to make use of the scrub that we've got. We, we wanted animals that would thrive on that system. As I said, we were quite concerned about, oh, oh yeah, I wanted to talk about willow. So also when we first came here, we planted quite a lot of biomass willow because we thought that was another crop that we could sell from the farm. It would provide really rapid shelter. We were we face kind of southwest, half of our farm faces southwest straight into the, the prevailing winds. So when we first came here, we planted up quite a few willow beds. And knowing that we wanted to keep what was intent usually kept relatively intensively in small areas and fed lots of inputs goats I was sort of familiar with most people keeping goats on small acreages and I knew I wanted to keep them on really big areas and not feed them a lot I thought they would fit well with our willow production because we could make tree hay and also have willow as an early food source in the spring when maybe the grass hadn't got going because we're quite a late spring here it can be May before the grass really gets going so that's just to show some of the biomass willow stacked up for sale. And also willow, as I'm sure loads of people know, it's brilliant if you've got something poorly and um, when they won't eat anything else, they usually eat with some willow. So the Guernseys on you were quite a docile breed, although some of our land is deer fenced around the woodland blocks. Most of it is just normal stock net, you know, stock net with a line of barb at the top. Um, and we also have quite a lot of stone walls. And I can attest that a normal stock net will keep a golden Guernsey in absolutely no problem. A stone wall will not. <laughs> stone wall is basically a plaything for a goat. And they think, oh, great, we'll just hop on here and get over. Um, having said that, they've very rarely gone walkabout and they do get quite attached to the, the area that they live in. I also wanted something that was not too big and not too dairy. Um, I did want to maintain the dual purpose characteristics that I like so much about my Shetland cattle. So as I say, I wanted that opportunity to milk them um, and I wanted something that would keep its condition if it was out and about um, grazing from and browsing for much of the day. So um, I chose my initial. So this is the first nanny that we bought. We were really lucky with her. She's been a great goat. She's still with us and she's in kid again this year. She's got a medium sort of medium long coat. And she definitely will go out in all sorts of weathers. And I think Adam's going to talk about this as well, because his goats are even hardier. But the kind of myth that goats will just dash for cover the minute there's a speck of rain. Either mine have learned not to because they have to go out and forage or, or it's just not true. Because they'll, they'll be out in even kind of moderate rain grazing and browsing. And I love how they look. And I always say to people when they're asking me, um, what breed should I get? I always say, well, you have to look at it in the field. You know, you have to like it. So... At the end of the day, you've got to choose something that makes makes you um, happy when you look at it. So we were determined that we wouldn't have um, a goat field. You know, the whole point of our goats was that they were going to do this scrub management job for us and they were going to travel around all our little fields. So what we did is we were given, we were really lucky because this would be turned into a gin palace and um, you'd pay £2,000 for it now. But this old rice horse box was given to us by a friend quite a few years ago. It had no floor all the ramps were rotten, everything that was wood had gone on it basically. So um, my partner converted it into this mobile goat shed and it's been absolutely brilliant. You can see at the back there, there's a five foot gate across the front nose cone part of the trailer. In that front section, I can put a couple of bales of hay. So it, it travels to its new location with some hay. That's where I store hay. You can also see that the sides have been stock boarded um, to prevent any drafts and so it's easy to clean. And hanging up there on the right hand side, that red bucket is a salt lick. So goats have a really high mineral demand. And so they always have to have access to a copper containing salt lick. And I put the photo on the left because um, this nanny very inconveniently had quads last spring. <laughs> I was like, oh, you didn't get the low input memo. This is a complete disaster. Um, but goat kids are really tiny. I mean, you think I'm used to sheep, I'm used to lambs, and I just couldn't believe how kind of tiny and fragile goat kids are when they're born. So if we only had one nanny kidding, we could definitely manage with our goat shelter. Um, but now we've got a few more. We do bring them into the barn just for kidding and they'll stay in depending on the weather for a week or two after kidding and then they'll be able to go out and use our mobile shelters again but 
they're so small as well that I was quite concerned about predators and foxes just taking them. So, I mean, they're particularly tiny because they were quads. They did all make it um, with their little chopped up fleece coats for the first few days because it was quite cold. So infrastructure wise, they don't routinely come in our building. We don't have a livestock building as such. We just have a section of a building that we use for livestock. But the, the goat shed trailer is absolutely brilliant. Other infrastructure, I think, I think that's it. You know, they, they're much lower input than, than I thought they would be. So I thought I'd do a few top tips. I hope I'm all right for time, Clem. Um, yeah, you're all good. Excellent. Uh, it, I said be patient because I think often people rush out and buy the first animal that comes along when they've got when they've decided they want to do it. And one thing which we did do, which I was really pleased we did, and it was not entirely due to intention, it was due to sort of a number of other factors was it took us years to find a herd of golden guernseys that was right for us and that's because our cattle are high health and I was absolutely paranoid about a disease called Yoni's disease so this is actually related distantly to TB and it's a wasting disease and it causes cattle or sheep or goats to uh, just get thinner and thinner and thinner even though they've got a good appetite and there's no cure for it and it's quite hard to eradicate because the test for it isn't very reliable. So I was really paranoid because I knew that most small-scale goat keepers, commercial milking herds test for yonis but most small-scale goat keepers don't and I knew it was pretty prevalent in either people weren't testing so they didn't know or they had tested and they'd had it. So I wanted to buy from a herd that had tested and had never had it because it can just kind of live in the soil and, and, and sort of take quite a few years to manifest itself in an animal. So I eventually found my, my perfect goat herd up in Perthshire in Scotland. And that's where I bought the original nanny with a couple of weathers to keep her company. So do be patient. And also something I haven't written on here, but I was thinking about today is um, confirmation. So just like, really do some research you might have a really good eye anyway for stock but what I found with our goats is that they've got really good confirmation the original nanny is a nice nanny she walks well she's very correct and she never has trouble with her feet whereas I know a lot of people with goats have a lot of issues with lameness and uh, we just don't they're absolutely brilliant on their feet and I know we've got rocky ground and they do wear their feet down but I think the confirmation of how they walk really helps them with that um, also probably the fact they've got a huge diversity of food so they've got a lot of different minerals minerals affect feet as well um, temperament I know people have ended up with some quite wild animals that haven't been handled a lot when they're younger just makes it more hard work you can definitely tame them down but um, getting ones with nice temperament to start with does make it a lot easier fencing I've talked about a little bit I think that this is quite breed dependent and quite um, Depending on how happy your goats are as well. I imagine if, if they were looking for food, they would be able to escape more easily. But because mine pretty much always have what they want, they, they're very easily contained, even behind some of our fences that I'm not very proud of. So I've talked about minerals already. Um, do you make sure they've always got access to um, a mineral block? And the medication for goats is really weird. So I just thought I'd mention this to people who might be thinking of getting goats. A lot of vets might try and lump them in with sheep but the dosage rates for things like wormers and other things are not they're usually a double dose of wormer and um, always do sort of fecal egg counts before you worm um, but goats can have quite a heavy worm burden and not really show any signs of it as well and then it can kill them um, so I know that they if you know sheep uh, don't assume that goats are the same because actually they're really quite different physiologically and I've put join your breed society because there's a lot of this talk is about um, native breed goats. And I think there's a lot of pleasure to be gained and help to be accessed. If you're part of a, a breed society and a pedigree breed, there's just loads of support and encouragement and the ability to breed towards something. So with my goats, I'm definitely trying to breed them slightly away from the milky side I have milked the goat and uh, the, the main nanny and it was brilliant milked her during lockdown it was fantastic but I actually want a slightly uh I was gonna say beefier but you know what I mean a slightly kind of more robust animal with less milk because I don't want multiples and there's kind of things go together I don't want triplets and quads particularly I want 
uh, twins would be just perfect for me. I think I've rambled long enough. Thank you very much. So that's uh, my partner, Wall, and uh, that was our billy goat. Oh, I didn't even talk about billy goats, but billy goats absolutely stink. We do always keep a billy um, just because of the disease issues. And I want to have a herd that's really high health and I test every year for disease. But uh, just bear in mind that in autumn, you will be able to smell them three fields away. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ruth. <laughs> Fascinating, brilliant. Um, yeah, I've got already got lots, lots of questions for you, uh, but uh, just of my own, but I'll, I'll save them until after. Um, remember, folks, that you can, of course, put questions into the chat and we'll be gathering those up and um, and asking those after. But um, yeah, I'll pass on to Adam, who's going to talk to us next. Thank you very much. Right, let's try and do the IT bit. I should be able to this, shouldn't I? Um, Perfect. Great. Yeah. You see that okay? Yep. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, to this webinar. This this is my very first webinar, so uh, I, I've got uh, uh, feelings to Ruth, feeling slightly uh, fraudulent about this, but um, we've uh, yeah we've done a fair bit. I think it's fair to say with old English goats, so I can probably talk about that uh, for about an hour, uh, but I won't. Um, and yeah, we're doing we're doing some I, I guess some sort of vague goat experiments with our, our herd and bits of mob grazing more recently as well. Um, so this is a little bit about us. Uh, we're we're down in Mid Devon, so straight away we're cheating because the grass has only just stopped growing in the last two days, so that that helps a lot. Uh, we're turning. I put a bit of that sea level because I don't want you Northerners to think that we're you know it's dead easy down here. We're sort of, I think estate agents would describe us as X more adjacent. Um, so it's green rather than brown, but, but we're quite high up, you know, and we, we catch the weather. Um, 26 acres, so we're not massive, but um, again, we, we sort of, we cheated a little bit when we got this place. Um, but the last really 50 years that anybody in the village can remember, uh, the entire place has just been taken for a late crop of hay, sort of, August, September time. So we we pretty much for no effort inherited species rich, uh, lovely uh, acidic wildflower meadows uh, and had to do nothing. So uh, yeah, apologies for anybody struggling to transition to that point. Um, but it, it, it's an excellent start and it means that, you know, so much of the foundation is already laid, which is great. Um, we have Goats and sheep and pigs and chickens and a little bit of horticulture. Um, we're rubbish at the horticulture, but we're we're planting up things like graze under orchards and, and all that trendy stuff and hoping to do a bit of enterprise stacking in the sense of offering out uh, opportunities to, to other people to, to run some horticulture here. So that'd be fun. Um, uh, I think from these numbers, I, I think we must we must be on the Botswana model then, because um, that's more or less 21 uh, goats. Was that the figure? Um, per household? Yeah, so, 21. Yeah, excellent. So we're on the Botswana model. That's excellent. Uh, we have a lot of billies here, um, largely because I'm the registrar for the Breed Society, and I kind of feel it's it's my job, if nobody else's, to uh, to sort of offer a bit of genetic diversity, at least down in the south uh, of the country. And we, we try and get a few places around the country to do that. But lots of billies to choose from. Um, but it's great running, running an all-male um, mob is is great they behave differently uh, and it's lovely i'll talk a bit about that later um so yeah the old english goats we we milk them uh, we use them for meat uh we sell them as breeding stock although it's it is not as profitable as gold and guernseys i have to say um but you know they'll get there i'm sure uh and for weed control so very very similar to root. um i thought i'd start off really by diving into the the mob crazy bit uh because i thought that might be um something on people's minds here there we go so this is a photo from oh about three days ago <clears throat> so you know nice and green apologies um that uh, uh it's quite shiny fence really on the right that is our mob grazing electric fence setup um i was speaking to my other house brother yesterday who's a sheep farmer in brecknock in mid south wales and he's using five strands of wire to keep sheep in so I, I don't entirely know what we're doing right or what he's doing wrong, but uh, there's some combination of not having acrobatic Welsh sheep that is, is working in our favour here. Um, 
we've been running this system now, this mild grazing system for about two months. So we're, we're doing it through the winter sort of deliberately um, because it's the hardest time. Um, uh, as Ruth mentioned in her talk, if if they're hungry, they 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 will just bat through stuff. They're, uh, yeah, they're, they're sort of the opposite uh, of sheep in their posture. They'd rather face a problem than they than run away from it. Um, but this has been working. Um, so we'll have one of those electric fences in front of them, and then usually one behind them. But this this is only a three acre field, so this is just split in half. Um, and that acre and a half of uh, this is probably the worst field for species richness because it has been ploughed um, once. Um, and that, that kept them happy for about three days uh, during the winter uh, and then on to the next half. Um, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing particularly clever about it, really. We, we, we spent a chunk of money with powered pasture, which is probably a thing for PFL members, I imagine. Um, and we bought the lightest weight kit that we could find, um, which consisted of some, some reels that clip on uh, to existing stock fencing. Um, and then these these fiberglass posts that you can just put spring clips on, um, and that's that's worked marvelously. <clears throat> I mean. So I thought I'd show you the embarrassing bits because there's nothing worse than posh electric fence setups. So I thought I'd find the bit of our farm that is the opposite of Kiwi Tech and their flash videos, uh, and that's pretty much this bit on the right. Uh, so these are these cheaper Gallagher reels that that are supposed to clip onto existing stock fencing. When you don't have one of your fields stock fenced, um, and this is one of ours that we don't yet, we've got a boundary electric fence with four strands, which is not high enough really. Uh, and then these reels uh, very delicately hanging off the electric fence. But believe it or not, this kept them in. And this, this was the front fence, and there was a similar back fence behind them. Um, and they were on well, what sort of five day moves through this field. Uh, in blocks, and this kept all of the goats in. Um, the, the picture on the left is just the other end, really, which uh, is, is not really too bad. I mean, it's quite smart for here, really. Um, but I just wanted to demonstrate that, um, yeah, sort of a nifty solution if you've got boundary boundary stock fencing already. So, um, yeah, that's sort of the mob grazing bit. So, uh, prepare for the TED talk about old English goats. Uh, Ruth's quite right, they're a very recent addition to uh, the rare breeds um uh, less the, the sort of the recognized breeds um i think it was 2020 end of 2020 we finally managed it um and and it's it's just a thing you know they've been here for hundreds of years they just got ignored uh, for one reason or another um that's the current population stats so there's not many of them still that is the main challenge and that's why there's not uh, more of them about and why they're not uh, you know talked about more i suppose Possibly the critical difference, or one of the critical differences between them and Golden Guernseys is they, they've got this triple coated thing. Um, if you remember the picture of um, Ruth Golden Guernseys, it's, it's got the short uh, sort of hair that you would expect on a yeah, horse or a dairy goat or that sort of thing. And then it's got that longer coat over the top of it. Um, the Old English uh, all should have a cashmere layer as well. And that exists underneath all of those hairs. It's a very, very fine grey fuzz, uh, and they shed it in the spring, so you can see it coming out. Um, and that gives them almost uh, as much weatherproofing as sheep. Uh, so that's that's really what enables these to be outside all the time. Now I'll put zero on inputs there, and this is probably this is probably the only point of serious divergence I think between Ruth system and our system. Um, and we get away with it, I guess, because of the modest output element of these goats. But um, I was very, very intrigued by this statement um, when we started looking into goats, that goats must have dot, dot, dot. And there's loads of it, you know. They must have cattle feed and they must have copper and they must have all of this stuff. And I, I suspect for, for reasonably high producing dairy goats, that's true. Um, I don't have any experience though, so I won't comment. Um, but we've done a series of blood tests over the years on the old English goats, on the males, on the females who aren't lactating, and on the females who are lactating. And none of them have any issues with their copper levels or, or, or any other uh, trace mineral uh, level. Um, we certainly don't see any health problems that are related to minerals that, that we're able to track down to that cause either. So, um, yeah, we're not feeding the minerals. 
the I mean, the, the reason we took a, a relatively bombastic position on that was because they've been here for hundreds and hundreds of years, and uh, Himalayan salt licks have not. Um, now, that's not to say that back in the olden days, there wasn't some solution that, that was bridging the gap here, and they almost certainly would have had kitchen waste or, or sort of crop waste and, and that sort of stuff. Um, but it seems to be working anyway. Species rich, grazing, a bit of browsing. Um, uh, Ruth mentioned the willow. I mean, the, it goes just going mad for willow. We're, we're sort of, that sounds a bit weird, we're sort of thankful we don't have a lot of willow on the farm. Uh, but we use nettles a lot with them. Um, and there's a few farms or a few small holdings around here that actually harvest the nettles uh, and dry them out for a couple of days. Um, and we use the, those on the milking stand. And nettles, uh, some, someone else will know the exact figures, I'm sure, but nettles are somewhere between 18 and 20% protein, I think. They are, they're really rich. They're really good food stuff. So, um, yeah, they go mad for that. Um, in terms of their, uh, their appetite, um, Ruth mentioned about the weed control. Um, we found, and I think this ties, it, uh, ties into a bit of the, the work Claren's done but, uh, with, with cattle, but they're very, very seasonable, uh, seasonal with their, um, their, their, their diets, their tastes. So there will be a point in the year where they really, really fancy the nettles and they will absolutely massacre them. Uh, marsh grass, the same. Um, dock leaves, thistles, um, pretty much any weed you can throw at them, there will be a point in the year that they will eat them. Um, and this impressive chap here over on the right, this is Nero, um, an old billy of ours. That first six inches of horn where it comes out of his head, that's really the critical bit uh, for eating that, uh, the prickly nasty stuff. Um, and if, you, if you've ever watched them eating thistles, they will rub the thistle stem up and down in that cleat between the horns uh, and sort of shave off the worst of the spiky bits. Um, and that, that, I mean, they will do that with trees as well, to be fair. Um, but that's what they're using to sort of tenderize uh, some of their less appetizing food before they eat it. Um, <clears throat> right, so the next slide. There, uh, there might be a bit of confusion in the room, so I just put these are not the same as the English goat. Um, I think there's four breeds on the RBST um, list now of goats. Uh, Bagot, Golden Guernsey, English and Old English. And, and it's a marketing nightmare. Um, essentially, there was a schism, um, sort of late 90s, early 2000s. Um, <clears throat> the English goat is essentially a modernised goat, and it's, it's. I, I always think of it as a midway point in the BGS stud improvement scheme, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, English goat breeders may swear at me for saying that, but that's fine. Um, uh, but they are improved. They're, they're upgraded. Um, some of the stuff in the lower registers of the English goat are sort of fifty percent salmon and that sort of stuff. So they're you know they're, they're very much a, a, um, a graded up goat. The uh, the old English wanted to maintain that sort of true to type overall. Um, over on the right hand side, uh, you can see this bit of a fun comparison we did for our RBST application. Uh, the top picture um, uh, in that image is a bit of art from Thomas Sidney Cooper from 1850. Um, and then just below that is our goat Annie. Um, so that was sort of trying to demonstrate that we'd, you know, maintained the type reasonably well, even in all of the chaos. Um, and also to prove that you know, they've been around for a very long time. Before 1850, um, there were, no, well, I mean, pretty much there were no other goats in the country. Um, you would have had the odd sort of ship's goats and things in port towns. Um, occasionally some sort of like uh, Irish drovers with, with probably Irish, uh, old Irish goats coming through, which are very, very similar. Um, but mostly, uh, you know, by and large, they would have been this goat. And then sort of 1870s, 1880s onwards, there was the import, slow import of, of the Swiss goats and the Nubian goats. The, uh, the 1910s and 1920s is where it all went wrong. And the British Goat Society said, uh, stop using all of your uh, native billies, get rid of them, they're no good. Uh, what you want is one of these nice Swiss goats um, and use that as your stud instead. Um, and that was that was basically their fake seal. So by, well, uh, dates vary, but probably by the 50s, most of them were gone. Um, we've got pedigree records going back to the 60s, um, but through a combination of, of, of 
crossbreeding with with British primitive goats and 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 some of the original English goat stock, um, we we've still got the same type. Whether we can ever prove lineage to uh, you know the last of the old English goats is debatable, and I'll probably leave that there. Um, the the last thing to mention maybe is the this up the hell analog, which I absolutely love. It brought people to tears on this. Um, there used to be a thing, particularly um, up in the wilds up north, um, where a, a cottager, as would have been, so a very, very, very small, small holder, would have a couple of nannies, but not want the upkeep of a male. And they just let their nanny go up onto the hill to be mated in, in the autumn. And they'd go and they'd sniff out a male. Uh, it was not, not too difficult. Um, we try and main, uh, retain that up the hill animal by occasionally using a British primitive male. And there's a few stocks around the UK and we're, we're part of a DNA project at the moment to, to really nail this down. But certainly the Chiviot Hills up in Northumberland was a population um, of goats that we suspect have been untouched for hundreds of years um, in terms of you know, foreign breeds uh, getting in there. So occasionally we'll use one of those uh, for, for specific purposes and that sort of mirrors that up the hill behaviour. So this is this is maybe the meaty bit for some of you. <clears throat> so we do um, we do dairy with our goats. I mean, I hesitate to say that because some of you have got lots of goats and proper dairy setups. Um, we <laughs> this is the most uncomfortable dairying setup that you could envisage. Um, uh, and again, very much like the electric fencing horror show. That's why I've included it. Uh, th this evolves year on year, and we've we've finally got the plans for um, a goat dairy so that we can. Have a bit more of a production line, but but nothing too fancy. Um, we we hand milk everything um, at the moment because I think hand milking five nannies is quicker than washing out a machine. But but uh, somebody may correct me on that. We, we're getting to the point where the, uh, we're probably at that transition stage now, so we will probably switch to the machine at some point. Um, kid at foot uh, dairying is not massively complicated. I don't I don't think we. We wait until the kids are four weeks old, so we're definitely sure that they are eating solid food if they need it. Um, and then we separate them overnight. So the mothers will go in one pen and the kids in another pen. Um, if we've got fighty mothers, we sometimes have to split uh, that situation so the, the kids will go in the middle in a combined pen. Um, and we, uh, yeah, we separate them overnight, we take the morning milk, and everybody goes back together out in the fields in the daytime. Uh, we and the kids at 16 weeks, um, and then that's it. And then the nanny's hours, and we're sort of building up to peak output at that point. Now, the, the, mil the milk output varies a lot. Um, and I think this is fairly true of all breeds, really. Um, one of the reasons we settled on old English goats, as opposed to Golden Guernseys or, or anything else, was because we sort of believed the hype about the milk production, uh, particularly with Gigi's. And then, you know, over the years, having spoken to uh, people who've got them, who maybe don't have uh, any, any skin in the game, as it were, in selling them. Um, and, and uh, you know, we've got the opportunity to see some BGS figures. <clears throat> there are GGs out there who produce 800 grams of milk a day. Um, this is liquid milk, by the way, for any of you used to work, uh, measuring uh, milk solids in grams. Um, so, yeah, but depending on the individual, we can get between 800 grams and 1800 grams per animal, which is the historic range as well. We wouldn't expect to get much more than that. We found a couple of historic entries uh, uh, really about sort of uh, about American pioneers taking English goats with them um, in the sort of late 1700s, early 1800s. We talk about five pints per day but they are the only accounts that go as high as five points in a day. So I think three to four points per day um, it is about the limit, really. Um, but that is fully in GG range as well. So there's, um, there's uh, whilst they will go higher, so uh, you know, the upper limit for the old English goat is probably the limiting factor uh, in terms of anybody with a daily ambition. Um, and then we, we do milk through, so uh, you don't have to keep it every year, but the population being as small as it is, it's really hard to give accurate stats on that. So that's something that we're working on. Um, and yeah, I think that is about it for me. Um, the, these are the contact details. And um, yeah, I'm sure Clem's probably ready with a, a few questions or a, yeah, a little heated debate about Cocker, maybe. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Adam.
really really fascinating um yeah i'm just going to check if we have any questions in the chat um there's there's a few things been coming through um uh i think that uh yeah you were being asked adam how many sheep goats and cattle do you have and which breed of sheep um i'm not sure if you said about that ah uh, well that, that's easy i've got no cattle um okay cattle look big um and that that is the sole reason really and we, we wanted to start off with a simple life and, and small kit um, and our, our occasional forays with uh, adult pigs has, has sort of taught us better on that. So, yeah, no, no cattle. Um, we keep 30 breeding ewes um, on, uh, breed our own replacements, and they're all white faced woodlands because um, they're, they're a pretty good frame, although they're a rare breed and, and they suit us pretty well. And can you also just quickly mention where did you get your fence clips from? That was a question, a technical question. Uh, it's all for all the new stuff is powered pasture. I, I should be on commission, should I? <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And, and then there was quite a lot of, I mean, you partially answered this, I think, um, Ruth, but just maybe there was a bit to explore around this question of minerals, because that's something that's that's come up um, between you of do we need minerals do we not uh, and how do you know and um yeah if either of you have well Ruth what what are your thoughts further on that in relation to the copper is that through testing and is that a soil deficiency or is that so Cumbria is low in copper just because we have such a high rainfall and the copper content of your soil will be affected by the underlying geology so for example if you're on granite you probably won't be short of copper there's a sort of link with that and Penn was asking whether that's a problem if you have sheep and it really is with some breeds so the most famous one is the North Ronaldsay the sheep from Orkney that lives on seaweed it has become incredibly good at extracting copper because there's next to no copper in seaweed so you put them even on um, soil that is slightly moderately high in copper it will kill a North Ronald say so some breeds of sheep you have to be really careful with copper I haven't blood tested the goats but I can tell when they haven't had their lick for a while so I think it's a coat quality thing for me and with the sheep it's the same it's the fleece quality but it's also lameness I have noticed I took a punt on my Manx Locktons after a couple of years I thought I just think I just think you need copper. There's something about your fleece. And and I, I gave them the copper lick. And almost at the same time, somebody wrote in the Society newsletter about switching the feed. They did feed hard feed to their Manx Locktons and uh, having all sorts of problems at lambing. And it turned out to be a copper deficiency. So it confirmed what I thought, that Manx do need copper. But with our rare breeds, there's not the research been done on them. The commercials, you'll know, Swaledales need copper. Uh, you know, Texels don't. But no one's done that kind of research with rare breeds. So it is a bit blood testing would definitely be the way forward. Adam, Adam's got it right. I'm just winging it. <laughs> Have you got any more to say, Adam, about about minerals? Because that was fascinating. To me. I, uh, yeah, that you that you're just like going a hard line on. But if they don't need it, they don't need it. But well, I mean, it, it, it's easy. It's easy to take a position, isn't it? You know, that's that's kind of everything that's wrong with the world. Um, but uh, we we. You know, we, we wanted to test along the way and, and just sort of test the assumption. But, um, you know, I, I can't believe, especially with the wild herds, I can't believe they're getting massive amounts of copper. But but as, as Ruth very rightly points out, the conditions in the area are going to be a massive factor as well. We we do do bits of soil testing and, and fodder testing here. But, you know, we've got to focus the money somewhere. So we focused it on the, the blood testing as the sort of the, the end uh, of, of the supply chain of copper, if you like. Um, what's probably worth pointing out is that blood testing, although it sounds good, is not foolproof. It's not as sensitive as uh, liver biopsies, um, which has been the gold standard for copper testing um, for forever, pretty much. But you can only liver biopsy when dead. So um, it is of limited usefulness when you have lots of young goats on a new enterprise. Yep. I would say that the more varied diet you give your goats, probably the lower their mineral demand will be. Yeah, for sure. Um, so there's a question as well about foot care uh, with goats. So Ruthie did talk about a lot about confirmation and having that 
that resilience and, and not having a lot of foot problems but um are there that the question is around do you use foot baths or what other things can you do around foot care are, are either of you having concerns about that or do you think the breed is one of the the things that's actually solving some of that issue individuals within the breed i'm afraid uh, so a foot pro- it's very easy to breed out of lame breed out lameness in a flock of sheep or a herd of goats and i would say um, if people were more hardline about not breeding from persistently problematic animals with feet, then we wouldn't have the foot problems we have at all. Having said that, um, obviously some things like if you're having to keep your goats somewhere that's the same ground all the time and it gets very wet and paddled up, that's going to be more of a problem for them. So having dry, hard standing for them, if you don't have rocky ground um some people I know keep them so that they have access to a concrete yard, for example, so they can wear their feet down. And the other thing that our vet would say, we're really lucky with our vet. We've got a vet who's like the goat veterinary society vet. He's great. And he tells people who are um, more conventional goat keepers that just should trim little and often. So not foot bath necessarily, but if you are going to trim feet, just do it regularly and a little bit. We don't really trim feet at all, but if we did have to, that's what I would do. I'm just running low on battery, so I'm going to run off and plug it in. <laughs> Shall I pick up on that then as a, as a useful segue? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we we take very much the same line. It, it really is individuals. We're, we're on play here in Devon, so we we don't have a lot of rock for them to, to wear their feet down, and we don't we don't let them on concrete unless it's sort of kidding time or, or they're uh, being milked. Um, but we do trim, um, you know, perhaps twice a year, and it's, yeah, it's just a little bit. They, they will get overgrown. Um, but uh, I mean, we, we take the example of the, the sheep flock, really. We started that um, six, seven years ago with some ewes that we bought up at Holmfirth. And, and everybody knows the ewes you buy in the market are the ewes somebody else didn't want. Um, and that was very much our experience when we got them home. And within five, six years, our foot problems had gone down 90%. Um, just because we never keep more than 10% of our um, uh, sheep, uh, of our lambs as replacements. So we, you know, we, we track it and we cull fairly hard. Um, and yeah, five years on, it's, you know, it's nearly gone. What's left, mob grazing will probably fix, I suspect. Brilliant. Yeah. Any other thoughts about foot health? Just, yeah, do share ideas if- in the chat because there will be other people on the call that might have thoughts um so another question for adam um do you feed your milking nannies any supplementary protein feed well um the nettles as mentioned i know it sounds a bit happy but yeah they, they really are high protein um when we started um again it's another one of these sort of lie in the sand things we thought we're not going to buy any any compound nuts of any sort for any animal we're going to make everything from straights and then we know it's UK produce and we know what's going in it. So we used to make them a little mix of uh, oats, barley and peas, a bit of seaweed flakes, or maybe a bit of uh, chopped maize, something like that. Um, and they absolutely love that. They gall that down. Uh, they, they don't really like sugar beet, which is a bit of a pain because um, that's nice and cheap. They hate sugar, sugar beet rolls as a general rule. Um, but yeah, we, we've slowly moved away from that and fed more nettles or you know offcuts of budlier um willow if we can get hold of it all that sort of stuff and that's really it we don't have to supplement them with anything if we think something needs bringing up a little bit um you know perhaps during milking it it tends not to be but if it was then we'd probably give hay before we gave anything else um hay is just like crack to goats um it is far tastier than anything they'll find on the ground that is fresh uh, it seems. <laughs> Ruth, what? Yeah, what are your thoughts? Because there was another question. I'm just trying to link up the questions. But yeah, yeah. I like, wish yeah, how, I wish how... my goats loved hay as much as yours, Adam. There, that thing about goats eating everything—that is the one biggest myth that I found. <laughs> I got goats. I was like, they are the fussiest creatures on the planet. You know, they love apple, but if the apple piece has touched the floor, they won't eat it. I mean, they're ridiculous. So what we did quite a bit of an experiment with our goats because we have species rich hay that we're really lucky enough to get from our friends. Really beautiful hay meadows probably like that's why they love your hay, Adam, because your hay is so beautiful. That'll be it because they really go for that. 
So full of wildflowers, absolutely love it. Proper nice, sweet smelling, boring, grassy meadow hay. No, thanks. I'd much rather forage around in the woods. So yeah, I think, I think there's hay and hay and that they really love um, species rich hay. And one of the things I wanted to remember to say was that if your goats are looking less, you know, thinner than you'd like them to be and you think, well, they've got that hay in the hay rack, they haven't touched it. If it's been there a few weeks, it's worth just like emptying it out and putting some fresh in because they do like fresh, freshly open stuff. They, they're designed to eat stuff out of a tree that hasn't really touched the ground. So I think there's good sense in why they are quite picky. Um, but yeah, I need to go and get some of Adam's beautiful hay and feed my goats. No, no, I it's... completely, completely agree. We are, again, we're cheating. You know, we, we, we started off with a better, uh, you know, an easier crop, I suppose. But yeah, completely that thing about them being fussy. They're basically snobs, aren't they? They'll eat a wide range of things, but my God, they're snobby about it. <laughs> And Ruth, is there anything else you're doing to manage sort of calorie intake or nutrition around kidding or during pregnancy? Um, you know, to, in a in a concerted way to sort of make sure they're they're getting what they need or ac accessing certain kinds of brows or anything like that. Just saving the the biggest nicest woodland block for the months leading up to kidding, so that's their like end of winter treat is that they get to go in this beautiful big wooden block and just have so much diversity to eat. And, and I think because it's quite steep as well, for all our livestock, they have to work quite hard to get their food really because nothing's level here. And I think that's great for problem-free births because they're really fit, you know, they're really fit from climbing around and they're really, um, yeah, the musculature's are really good. And so, yeah, I do just try and give them the nicest. And the same with the other animals, they tend to try and get a field saved for just before they give birth. But actually their calorie demand is a lot more when they're in milk than when they're pregnant. So it, it's generally when you've got a nanny in milk feeding two hungry kids that you've got to watch and make sure she's getting enough into her. And that's like Adam's tactic of mob grazing. We, we're a bit more sort of rotational grazing. They might be in a field for a week or maybe two. Um, but that really helps because they have a wide variety of new fresh stuff to go out and then you're moving them on and they can go and find new fresh stuff again. And yeah, just in quick response to that about the woodland block that um, somebody's just asked, do, do they, what about tree damage? Obviously goats are known for, yeah. uh, for the amount of damage they can do. How, how, do you, how do you manage that and how old are the trees, I guess, in, in those blocks? Really good question. And again, uh, we struck it completely lucky with our individual goats, which do not bark trees. So the big Billy that you saw in the last picture, he did. So we just had to not put him in the woods. But the original nanny didn't come from somewhere with a lot of woodland. She's never learned to bark trees and she won't strip branches. Whereas my friend's Golden Guernsey, it will strip all the bark off branches that you give her. So, yeah, we are dead lucky. But I would say we only graze our woodland in winter. All, or from autumn onwards, you know, when the leaves are coming off, they love falling leaves as well. They'll get a lot from leaves that have fallen. Um, but I would not put my goats in the woods in the spring. They would, um, you know, they would stop re natural regeneration, which is a, what I want to happen in my woods. So, yeah. yeah Adam, do yours you. bark? Because I would imagine your goats would be more effective kind of foragers than mine, really. Um, the nannies, not so much. Um, and the, this is where I sort of alluded to, I don't, I, I probably forgot to, to say, but the, the billies seem to have um, fairly different browsing behaviour, you, you know, more or less, the, they're eating the same stuff. But um, uh, this time of year, we, we've often got them down in our sort of the old cops. It's like a defunct cops. It's a bit naff. Uh, so we're, we're planting up other areas at the same time. Um, but but they make use of that and it's a mix of everything there's a bit of grass lots of bracken brambles and and then a few stands of old sort of uh hazel trees and elders particularly um and the elders are now entirely naked um and they have fully stripped all of the bark of them and i, I think it's the headgear behavior that that sort of top 10 inches that i mentioned it's like a razor blade that's uh, everyone gets worried about the tips and they 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 don't care about the tips of their horns particularly it's that it's the 10 inches of razor blade at the top um, and they just they just thrash the, the bark like a deer would um, until it peels off and, and then they take it but yeah the boys absolutely love it the girls sort of take it or leave it really I've not seen any of them fraying um, some friends up the road who who keep lots of primitive things in blocks of woodland just do a simple chicken wire wrap around the bark of trees and that 
um, you know, anything that's sort of 10 years old or older, 15 years maybe, that seems to protect them. But you know, we, we, we know that if our boys are in there, it's sacrificial. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, so Suhail and Kristen, who are up, up north in Scotland, um, have a question around what sort of stocking rate do you recommend for the lowest possible inputs? Um, and for horned goats, um, what stock netting is best? Um, and I'm presuming that the stocking rate does depend a lot on yeah, how often you're moving them, um, what kind of forage they have access to. Maybe both of you can speak a bit more in detail about your grazing system and, and how you're running that perhaps also at different times of year obviously you've only just started the mob grazing Adam but maybe Ruth can also comment on her sort of grazing or browsing management um, and stocking rate that'd be good um, Adam do you want to yeah sure um, so uh, the, the the fencing one stuck in my mind so I thought that's probably the easiest one um, to tackle off we, we just use what used to be called C80 before it was high tensile, you know, that, that sheet netting stuff. But we use the ones with the, the white, slightly wider gaps uh, between the verticals. Um, I, I can find the code um, and, and stick it in if people need that. Um, they do stick their heads through because they think they're clever. This is only a problem in their first year. Once they learn that they get stuck if they go through a square that's next to a fence post uh, and you freed them a few times, um, they they just learn it. They're incredibly clever. That's that's kind. That's the good and bad thing about goats is they're very intelligent. Um, so after you feed, freed them half a dozen times in their first year, they know which which holes in the fence they can poke their heads through, and even with full headgear they can get back out. Um, so that's quite good. Um, in terms of the stocking rate, I've always found this a really difficult thing to answer. I mean, people talk about quite often talk about how many sheep, uh, uh, sorry, how many goats go into a sheep in terms of stocking density. And there's anything from two to five, I think, that I've heard. Um, uh, I mean, definitely that they don't take as much out of a strip of grazing as, as sheep would, I don't think. Mostly because they're often around the edge. I mean, they are physically smaller as well, especially the old English. And they're a very slight animal, but they will be taking the hedgerow while the sheep are taking the grass. Uh, any competition is going to be around stuff like plantain and um trefoil and all the interesting stuff in the grass you know it's it's almost certainly not going to be the grass in the in the summertime at least um we up until the last two months we have been rotational grazing like roof um we stick to three weekly moves um for no other reason than the parasite control really um and that's that's perhaps the other reason the, the other place where we're slightly contentious um in that we 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 sort of been religiously doing the fecal egg count stuff but but again speculating on how they'd be surviving as wild populations and that sort of stuff um and we've had pretty high um strong old group counts in goats sort of three thousand to six thousand and health scores absolutely fine um and we wouldn't want to push that any further so you know eventually they did get worm but it it really helps us uh, follow that sort of scops uh, methodology of leaving refugiate stuff so not not worming everything and, and not routine worming we can just worm the goats that have got problems um i, I mean as Ruth said different doses of sheep um and you know yeah there's the thing about it's handy to keep a few sheep isn't it because then you can buy wormer uh, for your sheep uh, which is much much easier it has to be said there are next to no licensed products for goats so it's a bit of a pain in the ass on the meds um it's also very difficult i'm just thinking about the rotational grazing impacts of the the parasite control uh it's very difficult when they're in uh, lactation and you've got worming issues um and then you are fully beholden to the vet's cascade system um we've got a solution that just about works with um cydectin oral sheep and and that has a milk withhold for sheep and we're sort of, that's sort of okay because the vets have got it on our herd health plan um, but again, it's another good reason to to keep them moving as often as you can, really. So, I, I, yeah, slight tangent, but yeah, go ahead, Ruth. Uh, yeah, we hardly worm the goats either, um, and they hardly need worming. When we have done fecal egg counts for a thin goat, it's invariably not been worms. It's been a nutrition thing that she's just um, 
carry you know they're quite a milky breed which is why Adam's got a much sen more sensible choice for a pasture based system in terms of stocking densities yeah I would totally agree with everything you said Adam like I can't equate it with the other livestock because they're almost complementary to the sheep and the cattle they they don't take as much out of the sward like Adam said they do eat uh, your thistles they do eat your docks they do eat your nettles and they eat your hedges and that's where they want to be they, so a lot of our fields um, will either have a woodland edge or they'll have a hedge and that's where the goats like to spend their time they also like a variety of different grass heights so sometimes they will go for the short sweet stuff but other times they'll just go for that coxfoot tussock and like really go for the course so they obviously want that variety in their diet but it means that I don't tend to move them because they've run out of food I move them because I want them to have a fresh field and I want them to keep moving and do the job for me around the scrubby areas so in the summer they move around my grassland areas and in the winter they're in my woods that's how they tend to work and how how what's the longest um either of you are leaving them in the one place then like what is your you know how often are you moving through seasonally or certainly no more than three weeks like Adam yeah they, they move quite regularly but do you but do you sometimes in the sort of fat yeah I mean is it sometimes three days or it does it totally vary throughout the year or um it wouldn't be three days because um I only have four nannies this time so in the past the most nannies I've kid is is two and so they'll be the two of them and their kids uh, so it's they they they're sort of incidental to my main stock they're sort of a, a tool Whereas I think if I had a herd of goats, mm. it would then trash my shelter, my mobile. I'm limited by the size of my my little mobile shelter. So you then have to have a breed, um, a hardier breed. Then you'd be more moving them on um, for the size of the field versus the number of livestock. Mm. So, yeah, it's just a, and having said they're never in a, an area for more than three weeks. That's a complete lie because in the winter they're in the woods for much longer because they've got about five acres of woodland to go at so uh, you know I don't worry about them in the winter and also um they're not needed to do that job of keeping the growing bramble from coming through the branches because everything's senescent in the winter so they they yeah it's their holiday home in winter they'll be in the woods for a couple of months probably yeah and how do the goats interact with like do you have a leader follower system for the cattle and the sheep or how how do the three of those interact with each other in your it's system. really funny they they prefer the cattle they definitely prefer the cattle they they'll kind of hang out with the cattle and and uh, not closely but you can tell with the sheep they're just disdainful <laughs> so it's great seeing Adam's picture with them kind of in amongst each other because mine not very interested in the sheep but they I mean they'll graze with them they're absolutely fine uh, obviously if you've got little kids what I said about them being quite delicate I would not put them in with um cattle when they had small kids Great. And and neither of you ever do any um disbudding. Is that right? You're you're all Yeah, mine are disbudded. Oh, yours are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you can get naturally polled goats. There's a problem with breeding a naturally polled goat to a naturally polled goat, because weirdly you can end up with a hermaphrodite goat. There's a strange connection with um the polling gene in goats and their kind of um uh, yeah, gender essentially. But um we have horned cattle we have horned sheep we don't have a problem with horns but the first nanny that we brought in had already been disbudded as a kid so we thought long and hard about would we risk having a mixed flock of horned and non-horned which now I think probably would be fine because I know other people who've done it but the thing that really swayed us was the fact that goats and I didn't really talk about this but they are ridiculously peoply they really want if they're, if they're tame they want to be with you they'll follow you around even if it's the nicest thing to eat if you walk away they'll follow you and they're very popular with our friends and our neighbours and our friends kids and our families and we just thought pointy uppy horns very very friendly goats we will continue to disbud if we bought a horn nanny I think we would have made the opposite decision so we just carried on with what we've got there's pros and cons to both any any thoughts on that you've obviously got big big horned uh, animals <laughs> yeah I mean it's <clears throat> I, I think a, a lot of it a lot of the disbudding thing comes from dairy world I guess and and the, the girls are worse for scrapping than the boys are really they've they've got a very complex uh, matriarchy a very rigid matriarchy um, and they will uh, reassess that every every few days sometimes a year 
Um, and it's quite funny, they sort of follow the rat as well. It gets worse in the autumn uh, during the breeding season. Um, so yeah, if they're very tightly uh, kept in, in, a, in a dairy shed, it, you've got lots of massive udders full of milk and, and horns in that, that situation as well. I could see it being a bit of a problem. Um, but the way that we're doing it, they, it, it just, it's never a factor in anything really, um, other than yeah, when children come to visit. Um, yeah, you have to watch where your eyes are. And, and the, if there ever was going to be a problem, it is somebody bending down to pet the cute goat, and then the cute goat looks up and takes their eye out. Um, and that's pretty much the only scenario that's, uh, you know, on our radar, really. Um, yeah, the, the boys uh, the boys are fairly soft, um, to be honest. It, um, I, I think uh, you mentioned the mixing of the sheep and the goats thing earlier. I mean, they, they, yeah, it's sort of by protest. They've got no choice but to be mixed with us. But we do see it when we mix uh, billies and rams. Uh, and that is, a, that is a sensitive operation, I have to say, because they fight totally differently. They don't understand each other. They don't think they are the same thing and they get very confused. And the rams will try and charge and the billies will try and, you know, stand up and, and headbutt down with no charge. And, Views the hell out of them, so they, yeah, they, they pretty much have full disdain for each other. But um, yeah, the billies and rams together can get a bit, a bit tricky. And um, in terms of old English, obviously you're, you're a big fan. Um, how, <laughs> how uh, can people get hold of old English? Um, so Suhail's asking about Scotland, but um, elsewhere as well. Obviously, you're selling breeding stock and trying to build the population, but what's the kind of status and what's the best way to, to go about sourcing Old English or I guess Golden Guernseys are a bit more widespread, but yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's getting better. Um, we, we do have one breeder in Scotland as well, so um, uh, we, we, we could get people in touch. Uh, essentially, the answer is uh, Ruth's last line, the Join the Breed Society. Um, it's, it's only 10 quid a year and it makes it sound a bit militant, I suppose, but we would really like for as long as possible to keep all of the breeding nannies within the society, just so that um, we're, we're trying very, very hard to focus on genetic diversity um, as the breed, because that is the only thing that secures their long-term survival, really. Having come from such a small, such a concentrated genetic base, we, we have to focus on that. And that means if you're up in Scotland, you're going to get some Scotland-appropriate bred goats. That's, that's the idea. Uh, they they may not be absolutely perfect for you know um, uh, any particular enterprise or, or or your enterprise will try as hard as we can but they are going to fit into the national breed strategy and that's sort of where we are at the moment so yeah drop a line to the breed society um, we will definitely help and um, if we can convince you to join it all gets a lot easier. <laughs> what about golden Guernseys, Ruth? Have you got any for sale? <laughs> no. and I would say um usually there's a kind of you go on a waiting list. not a, I mean if somebody contacted me and said I've got two people already waiting for nanny kid this year so I'm, if I'm lucky you know I'll have more than that but it is always really nice the same happens with the Shetland cattle when people contact you before things are born in the spring and express their interest and you know people are really genuine and that they've thought about it and they know what they want so it is always worth if you know of somebody or you follow them on social media and you think they're doing a similar system to what you want to do what Adam said is really true you know buying stock from a similar system where their rumens are more adapted to the kind of forage that you might be giving them rather than from someone in a really high input system is a great idea it's worth just making contact and kind of giving a bit of lead in really and and um and sitting tight and waiting. I mean, it's not to say you won't be able to buy them, but again, if you join the Golden Guernsey Goat Society, a lot of people do advertise within the society first before they go any wider. So it, it's, again, it's a good way to find stock. And just lots of help and support and advice. They're dead friendly, really nice people. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple other questions. I don't know if we've kind of already covered it, but just, um, well, there's a question about, will they eat silage? There's also, um, you know, apart from willow and gorse, and obviously we've talked about nettles as well, are there any other plants or trees that goats particularly like to forage on? Um, so any other thoughts about diet or or things that they like and, and the silage question? Do you want to go for that, Ruth? I can't answer the silage question because we don't make silage, so I don't know. Adam, do you, I just have a suspicion about um, 
listeria inside i just wonder if it's not a great idea with goats for some reason but i'm totally i might be imagining that so i don't know um no i've, I've heard the same but, but right. we're in the same boat yeah, no experience really yeah um but absolutely trees they're pretty eclectic in their taste you know they'll eat all sorts of different kinds of trees and totally love them so all your kind of native um deciduous trees they'll go for they'll eat a bit of scots pine uh, they just love bramble gelder rose if you imagine a really lovely mixed hedge british mixed hedge that's what they'd like to eat bit of hawthorn bit of everything yeah trees are their favorite trees and bramble is their favorite thing but someone asked about toxicity there's a massive long list of toxic plants um Lots of things are supposed to be toxic to goats that ours do nibble on, like damson's supposed to be toxic and cherry. Ours definitely eat damson and cherry and they're absolutely fine. So, you know, it, it's kind of a common sense approach. But what I said in my answer in the chat, for those of you that saw it, is just be really careful of exotics. So stuff that isn't a UK native plant, um, especially stuff like laurel and rhododendron. This is true of sheep as well and cattle can be toxic and lethal in really small quantities so it's your garden plants and people ignorantly chucking like garden waste over you know that's often kills animals because someone else has dumped their garden waste in your field so just be careful of garden boundaries and them escaping into gardens and stuff like that yeah uh, there's just a question now about sitka and also bracken are both of those on on that list of sort of toxic I reckon they could probably eat Sitka because people feed them Christmas trees, don't they, Adam? People feed their goats Christmas trees. So I think Sitka's probably fine. Um, bracken, we've got absolutely loads of. They don't touch it, sadly. I would love my goats even more if they ate Bracken, but they don't. <laughs> but it wouldn't if they did nibble a bit. An animal has to eat really loads of Bracken before it's toxic because it causes a vitamin B deficiency. So it has to be over a long period of time and the majority of their diet before it'll kill things we um we actually we were sort of hoping that they would um clear a patch of bracken pretty much through you know just randomly they must eat that they eat everything else and the, yeah uh, as Ruth says they they don't eat it but but because we use the billy herd down there they do fray the hell out of it so they they do a very similar job to the roller um and and they are starting to to make it recede uh, in that patch so uh, yeah, not through any particularly deliberate means, but um, yeah, it is working. I mean, the the other fun thing that that we've we've seen them eat, and I only mention this because it's it's sort of exciting, um, is you, um, and obviously that is the terrible. It is absolutely toxic to everything everything that's living instantly. Um, but I mean, the the kids are the thing that escape. You know, the nannies and the billies they don't escape. They're, they're the right size. They see kids are absolute buggers. They will get under anything, like microscopic gaps they will go under. Um, and it's the kids every year will nail little uh, ewe saplings and they never get very big. And they're obviously not taking a lot of it, um, but they then go on to live long and healthy lives. But, um, yeah, as Ruth said, we, we're absolutely paranoid about laurel and privet and things like that with the neighbours. And yeah, anything non-native is fairly terrifying. And weirdly, they quite like holly as well, when it's not spiky even spiky yeah i had a poorly nanny once and all she would eat is holly i was picking like armfuls of holly and she was just eating it all and when you think it's actually really oily isn't it so i think it's full of calories people used to feed it as a fodder so yeah holly's good yeah um and then uh yeah a question about um could old english work as a small-scale commercial herd I i'm not sure if that's in relation to dairy or um or meat um but yeah just in general around the economics of it yeah dairy um could it work as a small-scale commercial dairy herd but also just more generally obviously you're keeping goats for sort of specific reasons ecologically um as part of your system or to do with uh, the breed and sort of reviving that but in terms of commercial output and value to your business maybe each of you could speak a bit around that around yeah, whether it's you know it's a viable additional income or is it just a, a sideline that kind of thing I don't know Adam do you want to talk about the commercial side of old English yeah sure we're, we're very much driving in that direction to see what the commercial um, capabilities are or the, the commercial limits of them and we've got a plan b um, in that we've got a contact in the Channel Islands who's got some of the 
originally descended uh, GGs from the ones that were hidden in the war. Um, so that's kind of our backup plan if, if it becomes very commercial and we don't have enough production. Uh, we've got we've got GGs in the background, but fairly fairly productive ones as well. Um, but my, well, my backup plan is getting some old English goats, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We should swap. <laughs> Um, I mean, what, what we've been doing for the last two and a half years, really, um, is milking them and making cheese. And, and obviously, I won't say selling raw milk, because that would be illegal, but uh, yeah, for pets or something. Um, we're, we're building up to raw milk um, sales at the farm gate. We, it, there's just a lot of hopes to jump through, and there's, there's things to be built and dairy board to be purchased. Um, but what we've been doing is, I mean, we, we essentially wasted 18 months to two years trying to perfect goat brie. Um, and we finally did it. And we got to a point where after four weeks, there was a brie that looked like the supermarket ones did. Well, not very good. And after six weeks, you cut into it, the whole thing and melt over your plate. And it was absolutely beautiful. It looked perfect and it tasted vile. And uh, I think that's probably the reason people don't make goat brie. Um, that said, there, there was a few things that, that we could have done better, I think. But... I think that's probably the commercial angle with something that's as low, uh, sort of, uh, you know, modest producing as an old English goat. I think you've got to do the value add thing, I suspect, uh, or you go really hard on the health benefits of raw goat milk for lactose intolerant people and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know if people know, but there's a thing about goat's milk where some lactose intolerant people can drink it. And it's sort of on a molecular level, it's slightly different to cow's milk. The particles are all smaller and it's naturally homogenizing and, and all sorts of things. Um, so we think they will be commercial in that respect. We'll make like a what, like a five day old chevre, like a soft goat's cheese. And we will have our temple farm cheese, which is sort of six weeks aged. And that is our plan and all, all made out of raw milk. And, and we will sell that. Uh, uh, on a commercial setting, albeit a very small one, but yeah, if if uh, yeah, if at any point that needs to expand, we we probably wouldn't do that by just continuing to get more and more old English goats. And probably kind of point of viability where um, a, a higher producing different breed would make sense. Yeah, and Ruth, what what about you? Yeah, I was quite determined that they would at least uh, pay their way. But our the profitability year to year is directly and massively dependent on how many nanny kids we have, because the nanny kids are worth quite a lot and the weather kids are not. Um, so, so far, we've been relatively lucky. But I know that because they cost me so little to keep, they do cost me a little bit more in time, mainly just because their goat shed needs mucking out occasionally, whereas all my other livestock are just out all the time. Um, but they don't have to make me much money and still be profitable because um, I'm so low input. Um, what was I going to say as well? Oh, on the value added thing, the other thing people might think about is soap. Mm. So there's a farm near me that makes goat's milk soap and that's really popular. And the great thing about soap is it's got a very long shelf life. So with cheese, you kind of have this time frame. It's easier with the hard cheeses, isn't it, Adam? But um, you do have to be kind of keeping your turnover and sales, whereas soap, you can have it there and kind of maturing and, and have something to sell for quite a long time. So that's something people should think about. Maybe. Yeah, and you also don't have any of the environmental health implications of cheese making if you're making soap. So yeah, I know, I know a few people that are doing soap in Scotland because of the stricter regulations. Well, the ban on raw milk means that soap is a more viable business proposition than, than yeah, obviously you can still make raw milk cheese in Scotland, but it's, it's just, there's so many more regulations that soap is quite a good avenue for some people. Um, Ruth, could you also talk about whether um, your, your weathers and uh, are they going to um, an ordinary abattoir? Will they take goats? Yeah, our, our abattoir takes goats. We are massively lucky with the abattoir, um, but uh, in terms of having one <laughs> really close. Um, but I think most will. I think most will kill goats as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just seeing Peter saying soaps do have to be tested too. Yeah, you, you do need to send them off um, for dermatological testing, don't you? But just they have to test the recipe, I think, Peter, isn't it? And then once you've got that recipe tested, then you're OK. So. But you're not having to do the regular tests in the same way as you would with with your milk yeah um 
I think we're kind of coming to the to the end of the questions and um we've gotten a huge amount out of out of both of you um so yeah I think thank I just want to say thank you so much for a really brilliant and fascinating conversation this evening um and uh, yeah I've learned so much and I'm sure other people have as well and um we've got more webinars coming up on all kinds of different topics um and yeah, if you're not already a Pasture for Life member, um, there's loads of benefits to joining and being part of part of this kind of community. We aren't often talking about goats, but we could always change that. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, please do um, come and attend future events with us and uh, we'll have lots of farm walks and things as well. There might be demand to visit to visit one of you um, <laughs> from, yeah, the goat, very welcome. <laughs> from the goat enthusiasts um but yeah just to say thanks so much and thanks everyone for joining um it was lovely to have you all and um hope to see you again soon i'll say good night thanks <laughs> thanks adam thanks very much yeah thank you bye thanks all bye everyone